everyone. I am Karen Anderson. I minister to this congregation as we minister to each other. Welcome to First Unitarian Church in New Bedford Sunday Social Distancing Service. We are a diverse congregation of spiritual seekers who come together to serve each other and our community with love and compassion. As members of the Unitarian Universalist Association, we believe in the freedom of religious expression in a supportive environment, in the never ending search for truth, the unity of experience, and the inherent worth and dignity of all people. We are people of purpose, and everyone is welcome in this meeting place. We will welcome today Reverend Richard Fuchs. Dick Fuchs has served three churches in the Blue Channing District First, UU Society in Middleborough. And he is the Minister Emeritus of the First Parish in Norwell, Mass, where he served from 1969 to 2000. What a run. And as mm. a minister at First Parish UU Church in Bridgewater from 2000 to 2002, he resides with his partner, Connie Johnson, in Sagamore Beach and has a summer home on Cape Cod in West Dennis. He is grandfather to eight grandchildren, five great grandchildren and is a member of the UU Meeting House in Chatham. We're so glad to hear to have you here today, Dick. Thanks for coming. I'm glad to be here. All right. I will begin by lighting our chalice, our mini chalice. With our hearts leaning toward love, with our minds leaning toward justice, with our bodies leaning toward compassion, with our spirits lifted in fellowship for our common humanity, we light our chalice. I will hand it over to Richard for the opening words. I share with you these words from uh, Raymond John Bond. What is required of us in our time, said Raymond, is that we go down into uncertainty, where what is new is old as every morning, and what is well known is not known as well. That we go down into the most human, where living persons have vanished, and the music of their meaning has been trapped and sealed. What is asked of us in our time is that we break open our block caves and find each other. Nothing less will heal the anguished spirit, nor release the heart to act in love. So may it be. So may it be. Our opening hymn, which Randy will be playing for us, is number 128, For All That Is Our Life. And I'm sorry we will not have the words up for you this week, but enjoy. <laughs> We are called to use to be 
the reading of our covenant we come together come together as, as a religious, religious community, community upholding freedom, freedom of conscience right relationship and, and the, the inherent worth of all people we value our diversity and pledge to care for one another in the spirit of compassion to speak and listen to each other with respect and to promote justice and kindness in the world. That was the time in our service where we would light candles for healing, celebration, sorrow, joy. First candle this morning, the candle of love and sorrow. For the families of all those who have been lost to this COVID-19 virus, as we hit this grim milestone of 100,000 deaths in our country. We share your grief and pray that you find comfort with your loved ones. And the second candle this morning is a candle of joy. I have just found out. First Unitarian's Thrift Shop has been selected as the winner for the 2020 Best of New Bedford Awards in the category of thrift store. This is terrific. Our love and thanks to all of our volunteers who have made it such a great success. And boy, we hope we can reopen that soon. And as is our custom, I will light one final candle, which is usually two final candles. One for all, the sorrows and the joys we keep in our hearts today and one for all of those who have yet to find a safe and supportive environment in which to share their joys and their sorrows. Now we will have our responsive reading. I will uh, begin and Karen will be the responder. The golden rule on the world's religions. This is the sum of all duty. Do not to others which would cause you pain if done to you, Hinduism. Hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful, Buddhism. To the good I act with goodness, to the bad I also act with goodness. Thus goodness is attained, Taoism. This is the maxim of loving kindness. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Confucianism. That nature only is good when it shall not do to another what is not good for its own self. Zoroastrianism. In happiness and suffering, in joy and grief, regard all creatures as you would regard your own self. Jainism. No one of you is a believer until you desire for others that which you desire for yourself, Islam. Blessed are those who prefer others before themselves, Baha'i. What is hateful to you, do not do to your neighbor. This is the entire law. All the rest is commentary. That was from Judaism. Judaism, thank you, yeah. All things whatsoever you wish that others would do to you, so do to them. For this is the law and the prophets, Christianity. Blessed be. Blessed be. I invite you to enter into a spirit of meditation and prayer. Beloved spirit of creation that moves between and within and beyond us, we are living in anxious times. COVID-19 is spreading over the earth. 
Tornadoes and earthquakes and other disasters still cause havoc around the world. And the election season is generating a spectrum of emotions, positive and negative and very intense, and many things are uncertain. Beloved Spirit, remind us that we are interconnected. Remind us that we need each other for support and strength, for resources and resilience, for hope and healing. We can and we will get through this together. Blessed be.
And I share with you a reading from uh, Henry David Thoreau's Walden, some brief remarks that he made about philanthropy. Here's what he said. I confess that I have hitherto indulged very little, little in philanthropic enterprises. I have made some sacrifices to a sense of duty and among others have now sacrificed this also. You see, you must have a genius for charity as for, as for anything else. As for doing good, well, that's one of the professions which are full. Moreover, I've tried it fairly and strange as it may seem, I am satisfied that it does, does not agree with my constitution. But uh, yeah, I would not stand between any man and his genius and, and to him who does this work, which I decline, uh, with his whole heart and soul and life, I would say persevere, even if the world calls what you're doing evil, as it is most likely they will. There is no odor so bad as that which arises from goodness tainted. It is human, it is divine, carry on. If I knew for certainty that a man was coming to my house with the conscious design of doing me good, uh, I should run for my life <laughs> for fear that I should get some of his good done to me. No, no, in this case, I'd rather suffer evil the natural way. A man is not a good man, did it to me, because he'll feed me if I should be starving, or warm me if I if I should be freezing, or, or pull me out of a ditch if I should ever fall into one. I can find you a, a Newfoundland dog that will do as much. Philanthropy is not love for one's fellow man in the broadest sense. You know, I never I never heard of a philanthropic uh, meeting in which it was sincerely proposed to do any good to me or the likes of me. Philanthropy is almost the only virtue which is sufficiently appreciated by humankind. Nay, but it's greatly overrated. And it is our selfishness which overrates it. I would not, however, subtract anything from the praise that is due philanthropy, but merely demand justice for all who by their lives and works are a blessing to humankind. Here ends this reading from Thoreau's Walden. And a lovely reading it was. Now would be the time in our service where we ask you for your kind donations toward the continued good works of our church. As always, you may send your checks, your pledges, and other donations to 71 8th Street, New Bedford, Massachusetts, 02740. And we thank you once again for all of you who have been terrific about sending in your pledges. We really appreciate it. Now I will hand it over to Dick for his sermon and thank him once again for being with us. I've done a number of uh, uh, services uh, through Zoom. Um, when I first did it, it reminded me of a, of a chant, an African chant. Some of you may remember it. It went like this, Zoom, golly, 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 Zoom, golly, golly. Zoom, golly, 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 zoom, golly, golly. Thank you, Zoom, for making this service possible. Well, there's an ancient rabbinical tale about Hillel, one of the most renowned of all Jewish teachers, who lived and taught during Jesus' lifetime in first century Palestine. The story, the story goes like this. They came to the house of Shammai, head of a rival school, a young man, a, a Gentile, who was a scoffer of uh, religion. He asked Shammai to instruct him in the essence of the Jewish law, but insisted that it be explained to him during the time he could stand on one foot. Shammai became very angry with the young man and cast him out of the house. 
Well, uh, the young man then, then went uh, to Hillel, thinking uh, to no, annoy him with the, with the same ridiculous request. But Hillel outfoxed him and said, very well, stand on one foot, and I will give you the whole of the Jewish law. It is this, do not do to others what you would not have others do to you. This is the substance of the law. The rest is only its application or commentary. Well, the young man was so taken and impressed with Hillel's wisdom in wit that he immediately became a disciple. Great story. <laughs> Hillel, you see, articulated for the uh, Jewish religious consciousness, the essence of the ethical teachings of the Torah and the Talmud. What he stated in negative terms, do not do to others what you would not want done to yourself, Jesus stated in positive terms, treat others as you would like them to treat you, or as it has come to be expressed in capsule form, do as you would be done by. Christians later referred to Jesus' formulation of the substance of the law and the prophets as, quote, the golden rule, unquote. Crediting the teaching uh, to Jesus, but uh, forgetting that he learned it first from his own Jewish religious heritage. And ignoring the fact that the notion uh, has appeared as well in all of the major world religions, all of which existed before Jesus was born, with the exception of Islam. And Muhammad himself taught that the practice of this rule was the noblest religion. But 1,000 years before Muhammad and, and 500 years before Jesus and Hillel, a disciple asked the great Chinese sage, uh, Confucius, is there one word which may serve as a rule of practice for all one's life? And Confucius replied, is not reciprocity such a word? Do not do to others what you do not want done to yourself. This is what the word means. If you act thus, your public and your private life will arouse no ill will. Well, what the... Uh, Confucius offered as the rule of practice for ethical living was stated in more positive terms uh, by his elder contemporary, Laotzu, in the Tao Te Ching, when he wrote, recompense injury with kindness. To those who are good to me, I am good. And to those who are not good to me, I am also good. Thus is goodness attained which comes very close to what Jesus meant when he taught his disciples to love your enemies and do good to those who persecute you as an addendum to his own articulation of the golden rule in the gospel of Luke. Who knows? Maybe Jesus learned it first in the Tao Te Ching. Another contemporary of uh, Confucius and Lao Tzu, but, but in a different country, Gautama the Buddha attempted to reform his native Hinduism as Jesus later sought to reform his native, native Judaism. And in doing so, gave birth to a new religion and a new ethic which was in substance not fundamentally different than the sum of religious duty and practice previously articulated in the Hindu scriptures. Buddha said it this way, Hurt not others in ways that you yourself would find hurtful. Well, near contemporaries of Buddha, Confucius and Lao Tzu, uh, within a few hundred years before and uh, after, were the great Hebrew prophets Amos, Hosea, Micah, and, and Isaiah, who taught the practice of justice, love, and mercy as the essence of the law. And in that same period of history, there was the great Persian prophet and religious teacher, Zoroaster, 
who gave the Persian Empire its organizing center, while in Greece, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were offering to their people and the world the reflective thought and conscience of the Greek philosophical schools. This flowering of religious thought and conscience was manifesting itself independently in many places around the globe, concurrently or, or nearly so. Historians and religious scholars refer to this period of uh, human history as, quote, the axial age. And it represents the dawn of conscience and the realization by major religious prophets and teachers of, well, of the essential oneness of the human race. An insight that expressed summarily in various formulations of the golden rule in the world religions. Well, a Hindu religious scholar named Bhagavan Das says that the, that the rationale for the golden rule is the direct outcome of the ultimate spiritual truth of truth, which is, he says, why should I do unto others as I will be done by? Because I and others are in fact all one. One in the one universal self of the universe. Therefore, what I do to others, I do to myself. Sins as well as good deeds come home to roost. So soon or late, it may be. As I do unto others, so shall it be done unto me. The golden rule thus implies both a present and a future tense. And this is the basis of the oriental doctrine of karma and reincarnation. The belief that the good or evil we do in this life returns to us in equal measure. If not in this earthly life, then in a future reincarnation, in a new body, in a different time and place. Reciprocity is not only an ethical imperative, but a metaphysical law from which there is no escape, whether for good or for ill. Now, Jesus implies a similar notion of moral reciprocity, reciprocity in his teaching when he said, Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into our lap. For whatever measure you deal out to others will be dealt to you in return. The poet Walt Whitman put it this way. The gift is to the giver and comes back most to him. The love is to the lover and comes back most to him. It cannot fail. The universe will surely be complete to him or her who will be complete. <coughs> well, Jesus taught that reciprocity and, and recompense would be balanced out in the life to come in heaven or hell or some version thereof. The Hindus and the Buddhists taught the same thing, except for them the life to come was another life on earth, until we each progress spiritually to a level where we no longer need to be born again in order to learn the lessons of love and justice, goodwill and compassion. Well, the, the golden rule is certainly no proof of this ancient oriental doctrine, but it's easy to see why the two are so closely intertwined. For those who cannot accept the belief in life after death or of rebirth, the ethical imperative of the golden rule still makes sense as an affirmation of the way human life and society ought to be ordered. For those who attempt to live by the golden rule, it becomes a faith statement for the building of an ideal future world. Bhagavan Das notes that the golden rule does not attempt the futile and impossible task of uh, 
abolishing egotism and selfishness. But on the contrary, he says it makes egoism the measure of altruism. How? Do as you will be done by. Love your, num your neighbor as yourself because it is in your best interests to do so. But only those who can see their true self equally present in the neighbor will realize the underlying truth of the golden rule. Well, the golden rule is certainly easy to remember and inscribe on the memory, but ever so difficult to put into practice in the daily complex and sometimes ambivalent circumstances of personal, social, and political life. Oh, oh, oh so easy to say, but uh, ever so hard to do on a day-to-day -day basis. It's been noted that the Roman Emperor Severus had the rule inscribed on his palace walls, but he didn't do very well in terms of translating it into political practice. Service, you might uh, say, was a rather severe practitioner of the rule when applied to his poor oppressed subjects. Yeah, it's easy to be in favor of the golden rule as, as long as it doesn't have anything to do with welfare, social security, and taxes, and making sacrifices for energy and ecology and the deficit or providing health care for all citizens or changing our wasteful and selfish habit patterns of consumption. As Bhagavan Das so astutely observes, the golden rule cannot but remain a mere pious wish unless and until it is provided with a full technique and complete social organization. Yeah. What that social organization should be, <laughs> what form it should take, well, God only knows. Democrats and Republicans can never agree. Uh, the failure of communism uh, does not prove the success of capitalism and the ordering of human society. It, it only proves the failure of a monolithic form of socialism to take into consideration the needs and the strivings of human nature in both its collective and individual manifestations. Capitalism has yet to prove that it can bring into being the ideal state or anything approaching it. Beyond the forms of economic and social organization is the conundrum of human nature itself with its seemingly insatiable appetite of greed and power. As we have learned time and time again, the world all too easily regresses to the most primitive form of reciprocity, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, or as the mafia practices it, do as you would be done by, only be sure you do it first. This is what might be called the brass knuckle rule. Doing you in before you do me in. <laughs> well, I, I kind of like Bernard Shaw's tongue-in-cheek rendition of the rule. Do not do to others as they do to you. Your tastes may differ. <laughs> Clinton Lee Scott, one of our great 20th century Unitarian Universalist ministers on the Universalist side reminds us that though the Golden Rule is a great summary religious principle, it hardly contains within itself the answers to all of the many moral problems we face. Life, he says, is not so simple that its imperative can be compressed into a single command. Oh, how often have, have you heard someone say, I'm not religious? Uh, I don't go to church, but but I believe in the golden rule. Hmm. The golden rule, says Scott, can be and very likely is for many persons a substitute for thinking. Like any other statement of a principle that may serve as a stopping place rather than an incentive to organized action. For Jesus, the rule was quite obviously a positive goad 
to ethical action. For him, the essence of righteousness consisted in the constructive doing of good, of, of active deeds of love, not in the mere negative avoidance of sin. Feed the hungry, heal the sick, visit those in prison, liberate the oppressed, set the captive free, go the second mile, Give to everyone who asks. Lend without expectation of return. Do good to those who hate you. Well, not very practical advice for all circumstances, but definitely no basis here for moral passivity and paralysis of the will. Well, Henry David Thoreau, as we learned earlier in the reading, was, was not so sure he'd, he'd want a, an overzealous practitioner of the golden rule to come and do him some good. Although loner that he was, I have no doubt he could have benefited some good being done for him or to him, like Emerson did for him. <laughs> Doing good did not particularly mix well with uh, Thoreau's cantankerous uh, constitution. But he also recognized that there were those who were good at doing good and that they did so out of the natural overflowing of their own character and genuine impulse of generosity. They had his full blessing to continue to do what came naturally. Now the trouble with the glib use of the golden rule, uh, complains uh, one Christian biblical scholar, is that it leaves out the man who spoke it. Well, we can all report that there are those who focus on the man who spoke it, but often leave out the import of what he said and did. Well, in the last analysis, it doesn't matter who said it. The truth of the golden rule is more encompassing than any prophets who may have taught it. And there have been many. The truth is more than words and bigger than the persons who have parroted its phrases. Moral truth endures regardless of who may or may not have said or taught it. Yeah, the golden rule is so simple in its truth and insight. And it still waits for human beings to translate it into the complexities of personal, social, and political life. Well, doing good and practicing the golden rule during this stressful period we are now in of the global pandemic of the coronavirus is a challenge indeed that we could never have imagined. We are having to learn these days how to love one another, not by sticking together, but by staying apart. Who'd have thunk it even a few months ago? Show me your love, not by hugs and kisses, but by keeping your distance and wearing your mask in the, in the grocery store. I am waiting for someone to resurrect Bette Midler's song, from a distance to celebrate peace and love in this new normal world we're living in. From a distance, there is harmony and it echoes through the land. From a distance, there is harmony. It is the voice of hope, the voice of peace. It is the voice of everyone. God is watching us. God is watching us from a distance. Well, someone on Facebook said recently that, that we need to imagine the act of wearing a mask <coughs> in public gatherings of whatever kind, not as an infringement on our freedom, but rather as the simplest act of kindness that we can do in such a time as this. 
not just for ourselves, but for others who might have immune issues that could have devastating repercussions. A hundred thousand of them, of a, our citizenry have had those devastating repercussions. So let us learn to love one another again in new ways. Yes, up close, but also from a distance, from a distance. All of this is made for another sermon, but enough for this one. Let us pray. Spirit of wisdom and compassion, you have spoken clearly in the words of religious prophets and teachers the world around, dare to speak again even in us, human and limited as we are, not only in our words, but in our thoughts and actions and deeds, up close and at a distance. May we not grow weary in well-doing, but be ever nourished by the eternal springs of love and justice, mercy and forgiveness. So be it. Amen. Many thanks to yeah. Reverend Fuchs for a lovely sermon. Thank you for giving me the week off, not having to preach myself again. <laughs> You're most welcome. Uh, it's always yeah. a pleasure to see you and our love from our congregation to yours and to you and Connie. Stay safe to everyone else out there. Hold fast, people. Good. We'll see I, you next week. I leave you with these thoughts and words. Yes. May the truth that makes us free, the hope that never dies, and the love that casts out fear lead us forward together until the day spring breaks and the shadows flee away. Blessed be. Blessed be. And amen. Mm.